All right. Well, hello, everyone. Welcome back to That Escalated Quickly. My name is Charlotte Wilder, and I'm Executive Director here at the Trust and Safety Professional Association, or TSPA. Um, as repeat viewers know, uh, TSPA is a nonprofit supporting the global community of people working in online trust and safety. Uh, we work alongside the people on trust and safety teams around the world to develop expertise, skills, and the relationships that they need to navigate this extremely unique profession. Um, we want to be a place Place where folks can connect uh, with a network of their peers, they can feel safe in exchanging ideas about the, the work that they do and how that work should be done, um, and they can find guidance on how to think about their career path. Um, this is a series where we're talking to everyday people who've built a career in trust and safety. And what's really interesting about where we are in the field today is that most people um, who are in trust and safety today did not start out thinking, I'm going to go into trust and safety because it wasn't, um, you know, it wasn't a, a formalized field when, when a lot of us started our careers. Uh, so this series is an opportunity to find some folks who got here in interesting and unusual ways, talk to them about the choices that they made along the way that ultimately landed them where they are now. Um, so today we are speaking with Adeline Sai and Patrick Early. Um, Adeline is not only um, on the board of TSPA, she's actually a co-founder of TSPA. Uh, so we're delighted to have her here to lead the conversation, and she is going to introduce you to Patrick. Uh, before I head off here, just a little note, um, you will be able to ask questions. Um, you're going to be able to ask questions in the chat, and uh, we'll be taking questions in about um, sort of half an hour in or so. So uh, feel free to submit those, and um, I'll pop in a little later to get asking those. But for now, Adeline, take it away. Thanks so much. Um, thank you, everyone, for coming to um, our webinar today. Um, I am super delighted to introduce you all to Patrick. Um, so Patrick is currently the lead policy manager for the Trust and Safety Policy Team at the Wikimedia Foundation, who has been a very, uh, really huge supporter of TSP since the beginning. Um, Patrick specializes in anti-harassment initiatives and community-driven policymaking, working with hundreds of thousands of people around the world who volunteer their time to build Wikipedia and other free knowledge repositories. This is where I think Patrick bio gets really interesting, and I hope we can dive a little bit into this. But prior to working in trust and safety, Patrick worked in film production, libraries, wildfire protection, and other oddly disparate fields. So I'm super excited to dig into this. Um, Patrick also volunteers his time as a Wikipedia administrator and works with a local immigrant support society to help newcomers to the region. And Patrick is based in British Columbia, Canada, but as I understand it, Patrick is currently um, in Ireland. So I'm uh, really grateful for you managing that time difference <laughs> um, and hopping on the webinar. So welcome, Patrick. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much, Adeline. And yeah, it's not a problem. Five o'clock here. Um, and very happy to be joining you. Um, yeah. Excellent. Um, so I kind of, um, I'm very nosy. And um, I'm kind of fascinated by your um, previous experience and how that kind of connects you to, um, you know, where you are now in trust and safety. So how, tell me a little bit about this, this path that led you to trust and safety and how you ended up, you know, starting to work in trust and safety and then ending up at, at Wikimedia Foundation. Yeah, well, I mean, I think I had this thing definitely when I was in my 20s of sort of collecting strange jobs, um, you know, when I was going to school. Um, you know, you had choices of things you could do in the summer. And so I, I tried to do as many um, interesting things as I could. And yeah, one of them was um, working for the um, uh, forestry uh, departments where I live um, in British Columbia in the province of Alberta next door, uh, working as a wildland firefighter. And it was a super fun job. You got to do uh, all sorts of adventurous things, tour the country, um, fly in helicopters, um, and yeah, it wasn't probably as exciting as folks think. I mean, when there's not a forest fire, you're uh, doing a lot of uh, busy work, sort of building trails and stuff. But uh, the firework, yeah, I think was somewhat influential in my career in that it has to be very safety, safety oriented. Um, you know, um, it, people don't sort of realize how much focus there is in firefighting of just making sure you're not hurting the firefighters. Um, obviously you have to put the fire out, but um, if you're all injured, um, no one's putting the fire out either. Um, so it's a very safety conscious um, uh, industry. But um, from there, yeah, I had a, a film degree and worked in the film industry in Vancouver, which was super, super fun. Um, 
huge variety of work, uh, very interesting people. Um, and I think I did learn some things that were useful for trust and safety from the film industry is that, um, I don't know if anyone else has ever worked on film productions, but you work super long hours. You work sort of 12, 14 hours, 16 hours. And people just get like strung out and they get in fights and arguments. And, but the great thing about a lot of those crews, not all of them, but most of them, is that people got over the arguments. The next day they went to work, they, um, water under the bridge, move on. And I think that's something that you do run into in trust and safety work is that like you might find yourself not at your best and maybe you know get an argument with a colleague, but you just can't let it um, uh, fester. You have to just sort of move on and um, let it be. And so I think that's a really um, useful thing I learned from that work. Um, also just working when you're tired. <laughs> It's another <laughs> thing you learn from that. But yeah, from there, I don't know. Yeah, I was bouncing all over the place. I really love libraries. Um, always so as a kid. And so I went back and got a diploma um, in library science and worked in the public library system in uh, Vancouver. And I think uh, working in a, a library system in a big city, um, quite often library work overlaps with social work. I mean, you're not, you're not a trained social worker, of course but um, you are sometimes working with social workers and you're working with a lot of folks who are experiencing homelessness, a lot of people who are going through mental health crises. Uh, the library is a safe place. And um, so you do start to build some skills in terms of you know, how you talk to people, um, how you de-escalate de situations um, and how you care. Um, you, know, um, you could really define your job away and say, no, I'm a librarian, books, that's what I do. But of course, you know, people is the job of a librarian as well. Um, so really enjoyed that work. But while I was doing it, probably while I was supposed to be studying library stuff, I was uh, volunteering my time uh, as an editor for Wikipedia. And I don't know if anyone's tried it themselves. It's super fun, um, but um, it, it's, it's pretty addictive. And so I was writing articles about uh, things I loved, um, usually ge geography and music and film as well and um, got really into it. And then you get to a point when you put in a lot of time at Wikipedia where um, folks ask you if you want to be an administrator, um, have a few more tools. And these tools do have to do with um, behavior. Um, so you um, are entrusted to block people is, is one of the big things. And so I was never the most block happy admin, but I definitely um, started looking at uh, cases of harassment, um, uh, cases where uh, we had abusive um, people on the platform and trying to work through that. Um, the most difficult cases, of course, were people who uh, were very highly productive, um, you know, who were doing good work um, in terms of content, um, but they were doing very bad work in terms of the social fabric of Wikipedia. Um, and so that was, you know, I think eye-opening for me is that it's never going to be black and white or cut and dry um, when you're dealing with um, some of these cases. And so, yeah, from there, I, um, I, you know, I think at some point my mom said, you know, you're spending so much time on this Wikipedia thing. Like, does this ever turn into a job? And I'm just like, oh, <laughs> I don't think so. Maybe I could, I guess so. And so there was a job opening at the foundation for a non-TNS job and I applied and um, this is just sort of be a community liaison more generally for the tech department. And I did that for a bit. And um, Philippe, uh, sorry, Philippe Baudet, who used to uh, run the trust and safety, or it was called support and safety back then, um, asked me if I'd like to join the team. And that was 2014. And I said, hey, why not? Let's try it out. And I'm still here. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. So yeah, thanks, Philippe, if you're listening or if you ever watch this. But um, yeah, no, it's 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 been a really cool journey, and this this definitely goes in the bag of interesting jobs because it is super oh. interesting. That's really rad. Yeah, I feel like I've met a few folks who work at um, Wikimedia Foundation who, for them, becoming a contributor to Wikipedia was kind of like this gateway to like entering this, you know, very yeah. kind of really interesting diverse community right and it's it's so like you said like so much of it is about people dynamics right you can have these people who are really enthusiastic about contributing to this library of, of knowledge 
But at the same time, because it's all online and we don't really get to meet each other in person, there is an element that sometimes needs a little bit of um, massaging, right? And you were right there on the front lines really early, it sounds like, um, kind of doing that community building, right? Um, and trust and safety, I think these days isn't always viewed as a community development, a community building tool. But I think at Wikimedia, um, you all have this really unique role in that you're doing all of this trust and safety work at the same time because of the dynamics of the of the platform and the community, a lot of it is about consensus building and all of that stuff, right? Um, so I'm kind of interested if, if you're open to kind of talking maybe in more specifics um, about some of this, you know, where you've seen having to get really involved with this consensus build, this idea of consensus building directly with the people who contribute um, to Wikipedia, for example, because we don't, we don't, always see that on the kind of um, profit driven side, right? Um, so there is kind of a slight difference. Um, so I don't yeah. know if you can point to maybe um, a project um, that you've worked on where it has been this long road to really kind of build that community. Definitely. And, you know, it, it's a beautiful thing um, uh, that I think maybe a lot of platforms really would love to see in the user base it's just passion and dedication um, uh, yeah. and i think it, it's probably easier for us because it is a non-profit i think you know people do find it easier to volunteer their time for a non-profit but I, I think that people do care about all sorts of platforms and so it's you know, I, I would like to see it as a model that you know could expand um, outside of our little world but um yeah i mean uh, for people who aren't familiar with sort of the the online community of, of Wikipedia and, and the sister projects um, is that, you know, it is very much uh, the Wikimedia Foundation doesn't run the show, you know, we, we are in more of a support role and the volunteers do the lion's share of the work. And so and that that includes trust and safety work. Um, you know, the volunteers deal with, you know, very, very difficult situations in the Indian community and um, mostly do a wonderful job in it. And so, you know, our team at the foundation, it, it's really important that we don't sort of break any of that, but we, we find ways to, to support it. And um, what we've been working on right now is um, the concept of a universal code of conduct. Um, you know, our, our community, individual communities have quite often written um, conduct policies, local com conduct policies that are quite often very good and, and are functioning quite well. Um, but we have many, many, many Wikipedians. Uh, we have Wikipedias. It's hard to put a number on it because some of our smaller language ones aren't terribly active, um, but we have about 270 different language Wikipedias um, and then all sorts of other projects. Um, so in total, about 700 different uh, projects. And many of these projects have no um, uh, conduct policies at all, um, simply because the community is so small or newer. Um, and it hasn't had the time to, you know, they're building content. They did, they, they haven't had the time to, to, to build up a lot of policy. And so um, it was sort of recommended, we had a, a movement strategy process where we talked to movers, movement, uh, sorry, users across the world or contributors across the world. You know, what are some of the things that the, the movement is lacking? And one thing that came up was uh, just a minimum baseline conduct policy for everyone to follow. And, um, I think it was a reasonable thing, but it had this hard question of like, who would do it? Who would, who would make it? And, um, you know, I think it was also here at the foundation, we're just like, well, we probably shouldn't make it. We shouldn't write it ourselves, um, but we'd like to have some sort of support, um, uh, logistics and, you know, maybe the inspiration uh, role in, in helping it to happen. So that's what we've been doing. And it's, it's you know, consensus takes a long time. And so we've been working on it for three years now. Uh, we do have a, a functional policy. Um, and I think it's quite good. Um, it was written by um, a group of volunteers and a few staff members helped out as well. And they work together in a committee uh, environment. And I don't know anyone here who's tried to sit on committees before or write things through a committee. It's, mm -hmm. it's tough, but um, it's also good, you know. Um, you bring in a lot of voices and we had a lot of back and forth, you know, putting drafts out to the community, getting comments, getting sort of crowdsourced edits um, and revisions um, to this policy. Um, so it was, it was not 
easy work, but it was it was really 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 cool work. I mean, I really, um, I, you know, I think I was stressed out while I was doing it, um, but you know, I, I feel really good that we did make some progress with it. And so where we are right now is, uh, I think, uh, as most people know, a policy by itself that sits alone and has no guidance for how it should be applied and who should apply it and you know how do appeals work and all the the messy details of um, you know, actually uh, deploying or um, uh, enforcing the policy. So that's where we are right now, is waiting mm -hmm. for all that fun, de those fun details. Um, and yeah. so, yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, it's it's been really cool work. We've seen um, folks from all around the world um, um, contributing and really bringing in perspectives that would have been lost if a group of especially, you know, North Americans um, had just sat down to write it, or a group of, of Europeans had sat down to write it. And so, mm -hmm. um, hopefully, we've we've made progress in that area. Um, but yeah, yeah, I think you make a really good point about um, you know, as you were talking, I was just thinking about the scale of Wikimedia, right? Like the the sheer number of people who are so excited to kind of come to, you know, just Wikipedia alone, right, and contribute to like the world's knowledge. That's a vast group of people. But um, when you start thinking about, I think the complexity that that you've had to deal with, and I'd love to hear more um, if you're willing to talk about it. Um, some of the complexity around power dynamics, right? Like it's not it's you know, um, I feel like very often in the trust and safety field, we talk about like developing policies, right? Like developing processes. And I think inherent in a lot of our work is thinking about how to um, adjust for imbalances of these power dynamics between different groups, yeah. right? Um, and that's that's very implicit for the way we have our conversations, but not very explicit to people who don't work in trust and safety. Um, yeah. so I'm wondering if, you know, if you have any kind of like, thoughts or things that you've experienced during this code of conduct process, um, you know, maybe advice for, for, for other people who are working on stuff like that on how to kind of flag for yourself, like, hey, like, you know, there is something around equity here that we have to consider or think about. Yeah, and I, I think that Wikimedia is probably a really good example of this is that, um, you know, it, it's, it's an older internet community, you know, in terms of, of um, you know some of the platforms you see right now so 2001 and so we i still work with people who started that in 2004 2005 so they've been on there a long long time mm -hmm. and it's a complex little world in there um and so you know you do build sort of status and respect by understanding the complexity uh, within that world um but that can have its negative sides um you know we have this phrase called don't bite the newcomers um and it's it's a problem in Wikipedia um, because um, it is so complex and, and people who come in uh, as newcomers make mistakes. And so we also have sort of a, in, in uh, baked in um, demographic bias. Um, a lot of the older users, the first users um, came from online communities in the late 1990s. Uh, they came out of the tech sector, um, definitely in the uh, Bay Area and in Europe as well. And so it was very much, um, most of the users are sort of similar demographics to myself, um, you know, um, Caucasian uh, male, um, sort of younger or middle-aged. Uh, I shouldn't say that's, a, you know, there's definitely older users as well, but um, the SKU is about 80% male and 20% female. And um, so we don't have um, a healthy demographic in that respect. and. Um, you know, some of the, you know, I don't want to insult um, how our communities built themselves up. You know, they, they've done a wonderful, they've done, you know, built great structures and great policies, but this bias has been baked in, you know, how people communicate with each other. You know, it's, mm -hmm. it's very male, male biased. Um, and so, you know, these are things that, you know, you have to work with the users to try and fix, um, but, you know, you, you have to be careful that if you come in quite aggressively and try and fix these things and say, you know, um, we're the saviors, you know, the foundation is going to um, turn it all around. There's a trust gap there where the users are just like, I don't know, I don't think you, you can do that. And, and that definitely um, uh, applies to folks who come from different backgrounds, too. They're just like, I don't know if I trust, well, you, Patrick, <laughs> to be doing this, uh, to be fixing those problems. And so, 
you know, that's a, a, a deep complexity that we're trying to work with. Um, you know, we have seen a lot of participation from around the world outside of that dominant demographic. Um, mm -hmm. But you also see the struggles that those folks have um, working with the more established um, people in our community. Um, so, yeah, I don't know if I have like a sort of a real, um, you know, quick answer for what the solution is. Um, but, you know, identifying the problem is, mm -hmm. is the first step, of course. But, um, mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, there's there's just a lot a lot of progress still to be made there. But. Yeah, yeah. I think what I really appreciate about um, you know all the public facing, you know, the, the wonderful thing about uh, Wikimedia Foundation and you know the the folks who work on Wikipedia is that there is such um, there there is so much transparency, right? Because that's such a core value of um, who you all are. It's like very deeply embedded in um, the organization, and and seeing all of these things come out from the organization around, um, hey, you know, we have an awareness, right? Like that we have an issue here about trying to balance um, these diversity and inclusion kind of questions, right? Because it is such a, a big topic and we want there to be the equity. So I think that's one thing that I really appreciate about, um, you know, um, your organization is that the first step really is calling it out and saying like, hey, we have to think about these issues. We may not have a kind of complete and full answer, but it is something that should permeate kind of like everything that we that we do and think about, including trust and safety, right? Because yeah. as you, you know, you kind of detailed like such a core part of trust and safety is building up trust within the community, right? Like thinking about how do we prevent future instances of abuse, right? Which can be the direct result of all of these power imbalances. So I, I think I really appreciate that about your organization. Yeah, I mean, it's um, it's also annoying <laughs> that we know what the problems are and that we we, we haven't been able to fix them. Um, yeah. But, or annoying is not the right word, it's, it's frustrating. But um, right. uh, yeah, I mean, it's um, the core work of, of writing content, of writing, um, you know, articles and taking photos. It's It's fun work, it's enjoyable work. And so, you know, it's, it's not something that there is an inbuilt barrier or, you know, uh, everyone can do it and everyone can enjoy it. And so, yeah. you know, we do have to find out what the social um, barriers are that are, are leading to these skewed, skewed demographics. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, you mentioned that it's frustrating to kind of foresee, right, like where all the bumps in the road are. But I do, do you think that I mean, this is going to sound like a leading question, which maybe it is a little bit, but do you feel like Wikimedia Foundation is unique in, in that kind of like that trust and safety problem of like, oh, like, you know, we can see all of these issues on the horizon, but we don't have a complete answer? Because I kind of feel like having worked in-house, like I was flailing a lot, right, because some mm. of these issues are so new. So, you know, um, especially with like, you know, in the past couple of years, like conversations about disinformation campaigns, right? And feeling personally at a loss for like, hey, I'm not, uh, you know, like a like a government intelligence person. So how am I going to even start thinking about disinformation campaigns? I mean, I'm sure that's something that you you encounter, you know, through your work on trust and safety at Wikipedia at the Wikimedia Foundation. Yeah, and it, it, I should point out that it's a very small team. Um, I know right. the trust and safety teams quite often are quite quite small teams, but yeah. ours, ours is ridiculously small. Uh, I mean, we're a nonprofit, so it, you know, it's, it's, yeah. it's important that we don't uh, spend tens of millions of dollars um, on, on a trust and safety team. But, you know, it's, it's also, as you say, it's sort of intimidating to sort of see all these problems. Um, it's also super exciting. Um, because you are right in the thick of things, um, right in the, you know, anything that's big in the news right now has a trust and safety component that's active uh, in our movements and I think in a lot of platforms as well. Um, and so that's, you know, that's the sort of excitement that keeps you going and get, get you, gets you over that intimidation. But there is, I think, what they call imposter syndrome, where it's just like, you know, how, how am I qualified to be taking on these problems? And it's it's a tough question, but um, you know, I mean, um, interest and empathy and effort, you know, sometimes are the qualifications you need for some of these problems. Um, but the other thing I'll say is just you have to get used to incremental progress. You can't, uh, you know, be the sort of person who needs to see like, you know, I'm going to be six weeks in, and I'm going to have like 
you know, some serious jewels in my crown in terms of accomplishments, you know, you have to have more patience than that. Um, and that's something that takes some time to get used to is, you know, working on something for a year and a half, working on something for, for three years. Um, you know, it, it's a time scale that is, is difficult sometimes. Yeah, you kind of answered um, one of the questions that I was hoping to get to around kind of advice that you have for newcomers to the field, right? Because we're seeing, you know, I'm sure you've seen an influx of um, people who are really interested in this kind of work. And I think you, you, you answered that with the, um, you know, empathy is just really important, right? Like I know personally, I've always kind of felt that um, having some kind of, you um, understanding of why people behave in certain like mm -hmm. you know sometimes intolerable to my values kind of a, you know but but having having kind of like an understanding like there, there are people dynamics right that are complicated that you can't solve with um just a product solution alone i think that that's really important um but kind of extending that you know you're you're a you're a leader right like on on your team and and you've been doing this work for a while um from your vantage point what do you think has really kind of supported you in being a really kind of um strong ally for the people on your team um you know especially newcomers um, or you know, folks on other teams and trust and safety folks um, who are new to the field. Like, what are what are what do you think are the qualities that make for a really good trust and safety leader? Yeah, I mean, I, I think I've worked with incredibly kind people, and, and I've, I've hoped, hopefully learned something from that. Um, you know, I think I mentioned earlier this sort of you know forgiveness aspect that when you're you know having disagreements and arguments and you know maybe you're unhappy with with a coworker you're unhappy with a report or unhappy with a supervisor you know that you have to sort of you know um, work it through it in your head you know what can i do to to help the situation but also just let go of sort of anger or um, resentment and i think that's really important because you know i think any team that's going through a lot of tough work there's just going to be rough, rough moments. And if you let those sort of interpersonal um, rifts just sit there, you know, the team won't progress, uh, the team won't grow. Um, so yeah, patience. Um, I think you also have to get rid of the frustration of being, uh, you know, having to work on things when you don't want to work. <laughs> and so like, getting okay. stuff in the, in the evening. Uh, when you don't want to work on it, so getting things in the, in, on the on the weekends. And I don't want to say this job will be like 24-7. Some of you might go into jobs that are kind of 24-7, but like I think a lot of trust and safety work is up and down mm -hmm. and you can't predict the up and down sometimes. Um, and that, that can be frustrating, um, but you have to sort of build a, a relationship with that type of work. Um, what else? I mean, yeah, I think I'll go back to the kindness piece is that, you know, it, it will have to be a bit of a family. I, I know that, you know, from a management standpoint, you can't run a team like a family. You know, you have to, you know, um, you have to be a, a, a business manager. Um, but I think with trust and safety work, there has to be, this sounds silly, trust <laughs> between the people doing the work, uh, but there has to be some caring uh, between the yeah. people doing the work. And so I think that's really, really important. Yeah, for sure. I'm hopping back in here because it's time to start our, Q I mean, this has already been the Q&A portion, but now it's time to start the audience Q&A portion. Um, Patrick, thank you so much for all of this so far. And Adeline, thank you as well. Um, we do have a few questions um, from the audience in the chat, and then uh, we had some submitted uh, through the Eventbrite as well. So I think I'd like to start with um, the first one. Uh, we have someone saying, um, they're so happy to have found this little pocket of the internet. They're working on their thesis and hoping to get into trust and safety. They're writing about creating pro-social norms on the internet without an over-reliance on blocking or punitive measures in general. And they're asking, are there trends that you've, uh, you've noticed hosting platforms use to moderate behavior that seem particularly effective or interesting? Yeah, and so I, I'll caveat this that you know the Wikimedia world is different than say TikTok or some of the um, you know more uh, you, the, the, some of the other user submitted. Though I would love sites. to see a, a Wikimedia TikTok <laughs> mashup. Mash up? I mean, you know, like just something to think about for the Could entrepreneurs happen. in the audience. I don't know, you know. <laughs> would have to be nonprofit though, um, but. Uh, <laughs> 
yeah, I mean, I think that Wikimedia is an interesting experiment in not seeing the block as your primary um, uh, tool in, in, in user moderation. And so uh, I think that's a wonderful thing. Um, it, it involves a lot of typing, a lot of discussion between people, um, but definitely there's a lot of uh, second chances given and third chances given to people within a limit. I mean, you can't show up and, and exhibit certain behaviors and expect, you know, second chances. But um, I think that, um, you know, our movement has really tried to stay away from the block button. Um, and so I have seen interesting attempts at this in other communities. And I, I, had, had, <laughs> I, I don't know if I've seen any successful ones. And I think I've, I've had some, uh, some folks who are working in, in, in more academic fields, um, sort of assisting platforms on uh, looking at sort of restorative justice and um, more, you know, yeah, more pro-social attempts to um, get people to work together and to, to work on behaviors. Um, I think the uh, conclusion for a lot of those exercises, it's just a lot of work. It's a lot of work. And so this is why people fall back to the block button, to technical solutions, to algorithm-based um, uh, moderation, is that it's just going to take a lot of labor to go down the other road, but it could pay off. Um, so, I mean, I think that's something to think about is that, you know, there's been a lot of platforms to come and go in the last 20 years that are in dust, in the digital wind and um, you know what are the ones that stick around that stay you know I think they're the ones where a lot of labor goes into them um, so uh, yeah so I mean there is some great research out there I can't quote a paper right now off the top of my head but um, definitely I think uh, reddit did some work uh, in terms of um, uh, looking at uh, restorative justice um, I think there was some work done perhaps with Quora but with some other communities that explored it definitely this is the live citation needed like yeah yeah i always wanted to do that that's great um fantastic so uh the the next question we have is someone who says uh hello i'm new to tspa similar to patrick i started in the entertainment industry but with oh. a focus on kids physical media i'm now working in children's media as a con uh, trust and safety as a content moderator reviewer um, yeah. For a streaming platform, I evaluate videos for fairness, character diversity, educational messaging, and age appropriateness, while also dealing with harmful and inappropriate content. I'd like yeah. some advice on how to continue in this specific area of TNS, but with a shift to content and policy enforcement. And actually, this is a good question for both of you, I think. Yeah, I might give Adeline a kick at that one, because I mean, like, we, we definitely are sort of not working with children's content. In fact, we, you know, sort of try and... and um, you know, keep very young children off of our platforms in terms of contributors. So I don't know, Adeline, do you have anything to say? Is the, is the question, I'm just trying to make sure I understand the question correctly, is the question um, kind of, hey, how do I continue working on um, children's related trust and safety um, while also kind of keeping in mind um, kind of the, the broader kind of industry? Yeah. Questioner, feel free to weigh in in the chat. But I okay, believe um, I believe the way I'm reading it is that they are currently, um, you know, working in more like a, a moderator reviewer role, and they'd like to move to okay, a yeah. content and policy enforcement role. Um, and yeah. uh, you know, sort of how, how maybe up leveling and like I do the you know day to day here, and maybe I want to get a little more strategic, but in this field with this demographic. Patrick, did you question want to... or correct me if I'm wrong? But I, that was my interpretation. I think yeah, I could give a little just advice, sort of like yeah, sort of how how I moved. Like I I did work in operations mostly when I started and, and did move to policy because um, uh, no one else wanted to do it. <laughs> but um, no, I mean I think yeah, it was you. I guess I would say you're you're learning a lot of things in operations in terms of how to make decisions and just trying to put that into a larger framework and communicating that larger framework with the people you work with, um, with your supervisor. Um, so I know it's hard to be big picture when you have to get your job done for the day. Um, and maybe your supervisor doesn't want to talk about big picture because you got to get the work done. But I think just trying to start those conversations in a, in a good way, um, uh, things that can help your platform, uh, you know, make more organized decisions instead of um, more sort of um, on the moment decisions. Um, and, you know, start thinking about how you can 
reduce workloads through good policy. I mean, I think every manager and every supervisor wants to think about that. Um, so every C level wants to hear that that narrative. So I mean, you know, you can be strategic and talk about how good good policy that you've, you know, the things you've observed in your work, you know, it could be um, time savers and, um, you know, uh, make things smoother. Um, I don't know, it's a bit of a rambling answer. I, I think starting from review ops is a great place to start um, because you are at the forefront of kind of seeing all the issues that the people who are using your platform experience. Um, and I think Charlotte and I could go on about this like forever, but it is, I- This is my hottest take is actually the best way to get into policy is to not start in policy. Apologies to everyone who has started in policy, but coming in from ops, truly no better prep. Anyway, continue. Yeah, I, I mean, um, I think Charlotte is 100% correct. Um, and I think the other thing that's really special about starting from review ops, because I did I did some review before I actually um, moved into more of the, the policy space is that there is a tendency, I think sometimes when you just start in policy and think like, oh, I'm the policy person to kind of sit in this ivory tower. And I don't just don't think it works. I think policy or content policy is, is fundamentally an operations job. Um, and so um, I don't, this isn't, this isn't really advice, but all I'm saying is that you should feel really good about where you are right now, because all of the things that Patrick said about, you know, being able to spot these trends, being able to find those frameworks, all of those apply um, to content policy and policy development, and you'll actually be a much stronger policy person if you have been deeply embedded in the review work. So. I agree, absolutely. All right. We have one more question in the chat, which is uh, someone who is new to trust and safety um, says it's been a real learning experience. And they're wondering, as someone who works mainly with the content enforcement domain, I keep wondering how we evolve policies and how we keep our personal biases in check. It's a very broad question. I just like hearing different perspectives. So what would you say to that? Oh, it's a huge problem. Um, and I think, you know, the ivory tower thing, you know, a lot of folks uh, who are in policy, you know, a, it's their job to write policy, so they better do it. But, you know, B, they sort of think, well, you know, I've got the general um, uh, idea of how this policy should look. And, I, you know, I can get it down and working with my team, I can get it to a really good state. But I think what I've learned definitely with working with Wikimedia policies is that, and we have the luxury of, of putting our stuff out um, as we're working on it. And I know a lot of platforms either don't have that luxury or maybe tell themselves they don't have that luxury. So maybe that's something you can think about is that, um, you know, putting half baked policies out there as drafts, you know, is a huge, huge, huge benefit uh, in terms of checking your own biases and and, and seeing where you're, you're messing up. Um, uh, writing policy for a global community is, is you know, in, the biases are just everywhere um, um, and you're just blind to them. Like you will not see them until you you stress check your work with other people from around the world. And so I know it's a lot hard in some policy teams because, you know, it's sort of almost seen as a sign of weakness uh, that you're putting out something that's not, you know, a really polished finished product. Um, and your users might sort of laugh at you and say, well, why are you putting out draft policies? But I, I think it can be really, really useful. And so I'm not sure how it works in, in other contexts. Um, how easy it would be to do that, but find ways to get your users to look at your policies as you're building them. Um, I think that's really important. If you have the ability to put together a committee of people, of users um, from around the world, do it. Um, if you have to pay them, do it. Um, in our movement, it's not acceptable to pay people to sit on volunteer communities, uh, committees, but we are sort of realizing that that in itself, in itself is a bias. Um, and it definitely biases people who have more time and uh, you know, more privilege. So, yeah, I mean, think about how you might get uh, more involved um, feedback other than just like a feedback form, um, but get it out there. Let people talk about it. Don't be embarrassed. All right. Um, well, it's 
it's now time for me to say thank you so much to our guests today. Thank you, uh, Adeline, for asking the questions and thank you, Patrick, for answering them. Um, it has been just, it's always a delight to hear about this type of work. Um, you know, Patrick and his colleague Stella did uh, a pre member presentation for us earlier this year about their universal code of conduct over at Wikimedia Foundation. And I feel like every time I'm like, okay, could, this could be like three hours longer. I have so many questions. So thank you once again for uh, for giving us your time here today, Patrick. Um, just for folks watching, uh, TSPA, hopefully if you're watching, you do know what TSPA is, but as a reminder, um, we are a nonprofit professional association. Um, folks can join TSPA. You go to tspa.org, uh, and that is where you can learn all about what we do, um, what membership could look like for you. We have independent memberships. We have, uh, corporate supporterships where your company can come in and support TSPA. We love when that happens. So, um, please do go check it out. Uh, we also, um, have another event coming up next next week, if I can believe it. This is really moving. Um, it is uh, the Careers in Trust and Safety AMA. So a number of you I noticed in the questions are here, uh, sort of they're new, you're new in your career. You're thinking about like, all right, well, what like what does trust and safety look like for me? Um, we do have two of our advisors, uh, Pia Shaw and Dona Bello, answering anything you ever wanted to know about careers in trust and safety. That's uh, October 26th at 8 a.m. Pacific. And you can find that on Eventbrite or again on our website, tspa.org. So with that, thank you so much to Patrick and to Adeline and everybody stay safe out there.